So, so. Okay. So I guess Mike, Mike, I, I, what, endo what is the question at hand? Endo meaning June nineteenth, and the question at hand is orthogonal persistence. What degree and flavor would would best benefit snaps? Uh, yes, okay. that Very is good. correct. Very good. Yes, um, yes. This is a sort of you know threat or menace. Um, so orthogonal persistence. I think I posted a thing on Slack like a week and a half ago, um, giving sort of my little taxonomy of of uh, a sort of the solution space, um, which I can recount quickly for a jazz's benefit, who I suspect is not did not see this Slack thread, um, which is there is orthogonal persistence in the classic sense as practiced by, uh, say, Kikos or um, you know classic E, um, which is um, it just appears as if your memory is there forever. Um, and it automatically somehow um, uh, is 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 kept in a state such that you can always resume computation after a crash or a um, you know some some kind of event which is which has caused you to to have to fall back on uh, uh, some kind of persistent storage, um, which has the considerable virtue of being um, a very easy model for the programmer to work with because it's just like you know being lazy and pretending as if you never have to to, to actually save any data and this is a, a coding style that i think a lot of us are used to in the context of short-lived you know utility applications which run do their job and then exit and so don't bother with um you know you just pretend as if you've got you know all the state that you ever want to have for as long as you need it um it is got the downside that um it, it, one of the things that is in the persistent memory is the code that you're running which means if you want to actually replace that code with new code because say you want to fix a bug or add a feature uh then it becomes much trickier because in particularly in languages like JavaScript, which capture a lot of state in things like lexical closures and so forth. Um, the question is, what is the status of that state, which is which is not um, which is not named or even necessarily something you're even aware exists, but which nevertheless somehow has to make the transition from the old code to the new code, and how do you associate the new code with the old codes? data. Um, and that turns out to be really kind of thorny and nasty. Um, the second thing, second approach is sort of the traditional um, manual persistence uh, uh, approach, which is what basically people have used from time immemorial, which is to have um, this idea that all of your in-memory state is completely volatile. And anything you want saved, you have to deliberately save it yourself somehow, either by writing it to a file or to a database or something like that. And uh, all of the acts of uh, recording the state in a persistent medium or recovering the state from a persistent medium are deliberate um, and uh, are things that the code has to do itself. Um, this has the virtue that everything is, you know, under your own control. You know, you control the vertical, you control the horizontal. Um, even if uh, you're young enough not to know what that means. Um, um, you know, having having post-dated analog television. Um, and then uh, um, that has a long, long tradition of gajillion different sets of tooling and libraries and so forth to make that job easier or, or more complicated. You know, including various ORM schemes and various data represent formats, and you know, it's just the whole world of everything that that most people are familiar with. Um, and then there's a, uh, a an approach which is I I don't know that there's a, a standard term for it, but I've kind of labeled it automatic 
persistence where you have certain data which you you designate somehow either declaratively or through some um, uh, some kind of procedural interface to say okay this data I want to keep it and then any updates that you make to that are are somehow automatically saved and are automatically available to you when you resume execution but you then have the the responsibility of if the the semantics of your code changes as i say when you make a, a you know a bug fix or a, a feature addition um to as part of the startup process to recover whatever um in memory invariants you want to to do have which are a consequence of this stuff that you you have stored and that's what like the the agoric exo class um an exo i'm not i'm still not completely up to speed on mark's exo jargon um in spite of the fact that i wrote the the underlying guts that makes it persistent um uh and that that has a lot of the virtues of orthogonal persistent in terms of not having to be explicit about what things you're saving when and how to decode things or encode things and you know, not having to deal with representation issues. Uh, but it does require a, a residual amount of manual activity on your part in order to be able to um, reestablish yourself in a consistent coherent um, situation in memory when the program starts or restarts. And uh, and so that's sort of the three-way taxonomy, orthogonal, automatic, or manual persistent. And then, of course, within each of those, there's an infinite range of possibility of, of what you can do. Um, um, and... You're right. And, and like little tweaks that you can backpedal on certain degrees of compromise in one direction or another. Right. Right. This is not a this is not a hard edged set of categories. It's more of a, a continuum. But but I think we've discovered that uh, orthogonal persistence is um, a, a little bit of an attractive nuisance in the sense that we have. Um, I have to be careful what who's incorporated in the term we here, but that we have been um, seduced by repeatedly as being this sort of unspeakably cool. Wouldn't it be great if kind of thing that then we proceed to get into horrible trouble with because of its underlying um, uh, difficulties when it comes to code upgrade. And uh, and then having to do some various cumbersome um, job of having implemented this amazing orthogonal persistence mechanism, then to, to sort of walk our way back out of that a bit and and having to, to uh, uh, reconstruct our world uh, after having made all of these various uh, design commitments with respect to the code and then implemented a bunch of stuff that then has to be partially undone and re-engineered and refactored. And so now that um, uh, MetaMask is, is contemplating doing this, what we're calling the OCAP kernel, we have the opportunity to to go into this with our eyes open from the start with how we how we want it to actually work. Um, and uh, and and so there's a whole bunch of design decisions or exploration of design spaces, maybe a, a better way to characterize it at this at this point in our process. Um, um, having, observe the lessons of the trouble that you get in with the, the things that that have been done with orthogonal persistence in the past and yet being cognizant of the features of automat automaticity and convenience that made orthogonal persistence attractive uh, uh, in the first place and to to try to design something which is both uh, convenient, well, I shouldn't use the word both, that is convenient, otherwise I end up recapitulating the uh, 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 Spanish Inquisition sketch, that is convenient and uh, reliable and um, um, can be maintained. 
Yeah. So, so in summary, orthogonal persistence is attractive because it allows you to avoid many of the machinations that lead up to building a system with an, you know, with an ORM, an object. Yeah. Relation. Well, there's, 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 I think two important points of attraction there. One is you, you zoom, <laughs> zoom, you do this and zoom. God damn, it's just amazing. I don't understand. Um, here in the future, things are strange. Um, uh, God, now I've had derailed my train of thought. Um, there is the not having to write a bunch of code that historically you had to write. And that is benefit. But the other thing is um, there's lots of places where you can screw things up and make mistakes in terms of reliability and uh, uh, um, security and correctness. And the more of this you can build into mechanisms that work automatically without having to have the application developer lay hands on, um, the kind of safer and more trustworthy you can make uh, uh, the application developer's code be. Anyway, depends on which operational constraints you have as well. Like yeah. <laughs> offloading, offloading your database is attractive if you can have all of your multiplayer concerns taken care of by a database. But also, then there are risks it's like these query patterns result in these, these, these seemingly these seemingly innocuous query patterns through the object oriented interface can imply disastrous performance characteristics when when, when well, scattered gathered against the database and <laughs> yeah well one of the things that i keep finding myself ranting against and pushing back against is there is a uh, a, a, fra a faction of the world who seems to be very attracted by replicated data models with this idea that you're going to use the same data model everywhere and somehow magically it's going to be made consistent across uh, across the various distributed uh, participants in this yeah. network, which I, I reject out of hand simply because the relationship between these participants is inherently asymmetric, um, that there's a division of labor and that they do, different parties do different things and therefore they should not be using the same data. But in any case, that's our, our gravity well for or rather, MetaMask's gravity well. Who did we just lose? Oh, it's going. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Jazz, has Jazz has had his hand. Yeah, go, Jazz. Uh, so uh, is, is, there a, is there a problem with where you cut off the graph that you are orthogonally persisting also? Or is that not? Is that a solve problem? I don't know whether that is a solve problem. Mm -hmm. So, that, like, I mean, that, 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 kind of, that, like closing, accidentally closing over a DOM, and then orthogonally persisting myself is an example of, like, okay, now I have I have to save the world. That that is that is that is, um, in a nutshell, almost the entirety of the problem. Um, okay, that that okay. Which is to say, how do okay. you how do you draw a boundary around uh, the stuff that you know you have to take care of, um, the stuff you would like to have taken care of for you, and the stuff that n nobody cares about? It just should work. And so, so then the the counter to that, so I'm I'm trying to work out in my head what the problem here is. Uh, the other problem that exists is if I don't do that then an object that I am reliant on, I have a reference to, might suddenly change underneath me because some part of it got saved and some part of it did not. And I don't get told that like, dude, shit changed underneath you. And, and should, is, is the solution to this, I should not be expecting objects that I am, like, is this the actor thing? Like I should not be reliant on behaviors of the objects I'm talking to, I should just like trust the contract. I, I, I think the answer is well, all that that all depends. You see, 
Yeah, yeah. The thing is, 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 that, I, is that, I, I hate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just sort of, it's sort of, what is the interface contract? Is is in fact, what is the behavior of the object? Because the behavior of the object is what it does, and presumably you're interacting with it because it does something that you want done. Um, ah, but it does things based off of the state it's in. Right. Right. And you might be relying upon it to be in a particular state. Well, in 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 particular, there's the um, now I'm forgetting the name. What 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 is the the the, the is it Hiram's law? The yes, the, the, uh, you end up depending on state that you don't know about. Um, uh, and I and I I I'm kind of of the opinion that that's sort of that's almost fundamental to the the nature of the problem. Um, the, the, this idea that you can sort of wall off, um, that, that stuff behind sort of abstraction boundaries, um, is, 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 I think attractive, but, but, um, uh, I'm, I'm unconvinced of our ability to do that consistently and reliably on a repeatable basis. So... But I mean, I'm 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 straw manning here a little bit. But like concretely, uh, I send a couple of messages to an object, and then, without being told, that object may go away and then come back again. And now it may not know that it has been sent the messages that I have sent it. And now I'm sending it new things and it behaves incorrectly. I should know that an object can go away without it telling me like, no, not an object can go away. An object can lose its memory without, without it telling me. Well, yeah. well, I, so I, let, I guess... let, me tell, let me tell you about some of the operational characteristics of the pet demon. Because, not because they're like an absolute, but because they have answers to some of these some of these questions in specific cases, and give you a modicum of control over which operational characteristics you want based off of which APIs you use. The um, so the the pet demon as written right now does not have uh, for, for one it's it's volatile. Uh, a caplet is volatile, um, and its connect its connections through object for through the ca capability transfer protocol are also um, are also scoped to a session. So, if you have a reference to a remote object that is scoped to a session, and then if you send a message to that object after the session has closed, your messages will be rejected out of hand. You will be able to observe a, a state discontinuity with a particular instance because of the because of the session ephemerality of references over CAPTP. That becomes the, the, less true if we have three-party handoff, but it's still true to an extent because there have to be a pair of active sessions over which to transfer the reference. This is this is directly reflecting the sort of E concept of the live ref versus the sturdy ref. Yes. And then for the sturdy ref side, we have some, we have persistence of the activities needed to construct a reference that you were previously granted permission to by the user. And that's where the whole formula DAG comes in. And so if I request a thing, I may, everything may be, be lost. My my caplet might be discarded. My connect my session state may be, may be lost. But next time I'm incarnated, I can say, "Hey, I asked you for this thing by this name before this pet name. Um, can you give me a fresh instance to that thing? Um, and and, and have some assurance that it'll succeed." Um, so you have like two, yeah. Like again, like as Chip said, the sturdy. Right. The the live ref is the thing you interact with, that 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 you can send it messages and get behavior reflected back at you. 
and this it, but but it's it's volatile as you said um the, the sturdy ref simply allows you to get back a live ref for a thing which uh, asserts to it to itself to be in some sense the same thing that you were talking to last time um uh, uh, and and whether it is or isn't um usefully you know but basically not, not maybe not the same thing but something which is which is uh uh sort of morally equivalent to the thing that you were talking to last time yeah, and I'm it is a, in a matter of correctness of the implementation of that thing that whatever the hell happened to it during the time when you lost your live ref to the time you got a new live ref uh is such that um this expectation that you can treat it as if it were the same thing is in fact true um um as possible for it to be implemented incorrectly and for that not to be true but then we consider that to be a bug then then meanwhile you can you can take you can create a live ref that papers over the difference making it so that the discontinuity is unobservable it is possible to create a uh, a live reference through the handled promise API that just like when when the when the live reference behind the live reference dies, that it will construct a new live reference on your behalf and then silently forward messages to the new incarnation. That it that is a lifestyle that you can opt into. Right. Well the thing the <laughs> thing that 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 is um commonly the case in a lot of the systems, at least a lot of the systems that I've built or that I'm familiar with, is there is a notion of a um, a connection to, you know, a session, a connection to some kind of uh, process or entity that you can send messages through. It's not so much the thing you may send messages to, it's a thing you send messages through such that um, all of the things that you are talking to via that pathway are share a sort of common um uh, 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 a common existence in the sense that in the sense that um um you know when you lose that connection you lose all the live refs that were associated with that connection but when you establish a new connection you get a, a set of equivalent set of live refs back now there may be a a sort of a, a a laziness or or eagerness with respect to actually getting live refs themselves, but in some sense, it's it's you have a, a conduit into a box, and then messages are addressed by essentially by having two two components of what of, of the of the of the address the reference. One is which box of stuff are you talking to. And then within the scope of that box of stuff, which particular thing in that box are you talking to? So, so I mentioned this, this ability to paper over the difference between a live and a sturdy ref, because that is a valid design choice depending on the referent, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and, and also, uh, uh, how in particular, we, we, we tend to build systems that have sort of, you know, large complex of objects and so the that, that will have other relationships amongst themselves sort of behind the scenes that are that are if even if they're not state that we are explicitly dependent on they are a set of relationships between them which are very much part of our mental model of how the of, of that particular piece of the world works um, and we expect those relationships to be maintained over time. And so simply refreshing your connection to a single object, uh, you know, there may be relationships to other single objects that should be correlated with that. Yeah, and, and getting that causal, the causal relationships between like the, the read after write type stuff. Um, yeah. Is, is stuff that you have to orchestrate in your code. Um, in any case, so so yeah, it, it, as Chip earlier said, it isn't a matter of um, getting. It, it's not a matter of the the one <laughs> the one persistence model. 
like even in every one of these persistence models, you find yourself reaching for the others under certain circumstances. Um, like in in the you know in the in the entirely volatile, you reach for an ORM. If you're in orthogonal persistence, you need upgrades, so you reach for baggage as chip implemented for a Gorex chain. Um, and for the pet demon, which is in between, it has these two flavors I've mentioned for live and sturdy references, but it all, and then the third for like, if you have a CRDT backed object, you can do the, you can paper over the difference between those two. But then there's this other one that Mark is beginning to suggest that there, there is a mechanism that the chain needs now to do orchestration of workflows through upgrade, which has been an adventure on the end of an adventure. <laughs> you solved upgrade, but now we have otherwise ephemeral workflows that we need to persist across upgrade as well. And we want to write them as if they were orthogonally persistent within our orthogonally persistent upgrade. It's just like, how many layers can we yeah. go? <laughs> Turtles but, all the way down. But the but that async flow system is portable to the pet demon model, assuming that you have the pet demon's ability to store state uh, in in the pet store, As, and and just like so for each of these async flows, which look like, um, which look like like async generator functions or just function. I don't remember how it's implemented exactly, but it looks like an async function that has checkpoints at which it's, but its state is persisted such that it can resume from those checkpoints on the next run. And it's on top of, um, on top of a, on top of a manual persistence mechanism, either the baggage system from, from our chain or, or um, I'm sorry, how much of this is coming through? Yeah, I mean, one of the things which has fascinated me is the co-evolution of computers and data processing and um, and the world of payments and, and uh, financial transactions. Um, I mean, the, 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 because the international banking system in particular has had to deal with these issues for centuries. And they worked out a lot of these protocols that relied on, um, you know, messages that were literally things written on pieces of paper that were carried by sailing ships, um, and and um, you know, and having to deal with all of the things of what you know what happens if the ship goes down and, and, and at sea, um, and. Uh, um, and and somehow all of the the, the processes to make that work kind of got sort of sorted out and 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 what we're trying to do is to get back to a world that works at least that well inside our computers. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure where this conversation is going. I think I think. Um, well, time to well, turn over to Eric. Yeah. Well, let let me attempt uh, to yeah, steer oh, please, us please, uh, please, toward please, a safe please, harbor. Guide. Um, oh, fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> the, okay. So I think like based on, um, I mean, M Markham's written sort of uh, explanation and, and recommendations around um, orthogonal persistence that he sent in the Slack thread that we have referred to previously. He basically said, uh, you probably don't need orthogonal persistence for your use case. Uh, and I am increasingly of the opinion uh, that I don't think it will be worth the complication. I don't think our developers expect it, and I don't think it solves any critical issues for them. I, I, I think I agree with you very much on that point, um, both because it's a lot of work and because it's alien to their work. Yeah. And I think, um, so there's still, there's a separate question uh, of sort of like, do we use the session or do we use uh, XSnap Wasm uh, as our as our engine or or runtime, if you will? Uh, but that uh, that's a topic for uh, for another time. And well, an another another thing that, that 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 actually that that touches on, which is which is 
interesting is you can think of the the orthogonal persistence of memory thing as being um, kind of akin to virtual memory in, in a computer, which is it's a thing which can uh, uh, allow you to to paper over various kinds of short term system faults and um, and um, sort of restart issues and kind of you know failure and recovery for a category of stuff that you genuinely like to be transparent um, and you don't expose the application developer to any of the complications of the orthogonally persistent world it's just that you're executing on a substrate which is um, more reliable and so the xsnap uh, memory heap snapshot and reload mechanism could be just treated as a way to make the lifetime, the execution lifetime of a process uh, longer and more reliable, but which just completely doesn't address any of the um, any of these questions about upgrade or and any of that. We're not even going to try. We're just going to say, you know, this just makes it a little bit more reliable. And in, and the fact that it's using orthogonal persistence under the hood is an implementation detail that we never expose to anyone. And at that point, that trade-off of do you do it as a, you know, excess running in WASM, or do you do it as a, uh, you know, a, a Chrome process running in, you know, a JavaScript thing in 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 V8, um, as a, you know, performance trade-off question. Um, you know, is it going to be fast enough? Is it, is it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a purely pragmatic thing that doesn't impinge on um, the, the application programmer's model of the world at all. It's just a question of, you know, performance trade-offs, for example. Yeah. So things, things that other reasons why the decision of whether to embrace excess or not is orthogonal to orthogonal persistence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, include that uh, excess gives you uh, uh, gives you the ability to appraise a, uh, to uh, um, to it gives you an eval escape hatch under the uh, no unsafe eval uh, content security policy that might be enforced by extensions um, while yeah, allowing I it also forgotten about that one reach yeah. out to another domain uh, under under MetaMask's control and actually make it more decentralized that way while still having living within the boundaries that Google imposes upon an extension. Other and yeah, and as Chip mentions, whether you embrace orthogonal persistence is also orthogonal to whether you embrace upgrade. Um, like you don't have to embrace upgrade. You can do like you can still benefit from having snapshots and paging an application out from time to time um, and just never support code upgrade except or to ex to to support code upgrade only using traditional means traditional means yeah other other manually <clears throat> state re recovery through a crash only uh, program yeah, I, yeah it, it's interesting I had I had flagged um orthogonal persistence, native hardening, and metering as three things that XS gave you. I had completely missed CSP evasion. The, 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 that's the, probably pretty important. Yeah, no, the CSP thing uh, is important and relevant, but we have, um, uh, we, we do uh, get around this today yeah. uh, uh, already using the session. And in fact, we used to have to, um, Post a static web page uh, that we then load into an iframe uh, in order to in order to get around this problem. But actually, it turned out that it, Manifest V3, which we we just shipped the Manifest V3 version of the extension, it's in production now. Uh, we are actually able to do the execution completely locally using a, a feature called Sandbox Pages, uh, which did not work. Uh, under uh, under manifest v2 but uh, for whatever reason it does work uh, and is not affected by the overall like extension csp and like uh, unsafe eval uh, restrictions 
So uh, we, we are currently in production doing it. Uh, like we load the HTML page, we bundle it with the extension and then open it as a sandbox page and execute it uh, in that without fetching anything from the network. That, that... I'm going to beg you for a blog on that technique. Uh, I'm, can, I'm can, going oh. to forward this to the... Uh... Can, 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 can you also spend a couple more words on <laughs> what the CSP... I mean, just what, what did you call it? CSP, not CSP. I, I, I yeah, don't remember. CSP evasion? Uh, yeah. Evasion. <laughs> no, no, no. Talk to me <laughs> about CSP evasion. <laughs> Absolutely. It is not an evasion. It is not an evasion. It's totally. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Text Every, avoidance everything we're and doing text is evasion. perfectly legal. Um, uh, the. Uh, and sanctioned, in fact, uh, by the Chrome team. So the so the so the extension CSP, uh, you have to normally uh, extensions forbid you from using uh, eval inside of uh, inside of your extension background script or UI even I think, uh, and you have to add unsafe eval to the CSP like field in your extension manifest in order to get around that. And if you do that, uh, you get sent to the, you know, you you get sent to the dungeons of the Chrome Web Store. Get sent uh, to the principal's office. Yeah, you, you you and I think actually Firefox like they don't even let you into their uh, official extension store if you have unsafe eval enabled in your in your manifest, and so. Uh, but however, the like uh, Chrome extensions team recognizing that, you know, people may uh, want to use eval for whatever reason, uh, and that there are ways, and that there are ways to do that, that doesn't, um, you know, expose, um, because their concern is that like, uh, you use unsafe eval to load fetch code at runtime that then does stuff using the, uh, Chrome APIs. Uh, that they can't catch during review that they don't want to happen. And so they do allow you to use eval in uh, in sandbox pages in manifest v3 because you can't access any of the Chrome like APIs directly in such a page anyway. Yeah. Let's see my my yeah that that is at least um, uh, that is at least my understanding. No, that that makes uh, that makes a, a good deal thinking. of sense. And and in, in in essentially what they're doing is they're taking the the world that we create by running um, XS in a WASM process, which is effectively makes a sandbox, and codifying that only it actually runs directly in in uh, in V8. Now, in any case, this is huge. This changes the landscape of the motivations considerably. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, see, I, I have this fantasy of the world where you can say, yeah, open that email attachment, click that link, open that file, plug in that thumb drive, nothing bad's going to happen. And it seems like that's the world that should exist. Um, um, and and the fact that, that that people keep giving this advice not to do those things is just a sign of the the learned helplessness of the contemporary computer security community and that we should be able to provide a solution that's an actual solution but one one question for 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 us at, at metamask is i think how much of that vision do we want to bite off as a component of the the the, the thing that we're undertaking to do since that's kind of not the core of the purpose for are doing the things they were doing but it, god it would be nice all right well the, yeah now now that my uh view of the world is corrected uh i will have to think about a whole bunch of things but um none of those are related to whether you embrace orthogonal persistence they are <laughs> orthogonal <laughs> Yeah, so uh, to return to that uh, conversation briefly, I'm trying to find. I just I just did share uh, the uh, pull request uh, where we implemented uh, sandbox pages in the uh, extension as the execution environment. Uh, there ought to be uh, a corresponding one 
uh, for the snap specific code that I can't find. And I just I tried to follow that it. link and got the stupid consensus Okta. Oh yes. Uh, that, thing. That, yeah. So which suggests that that that. that uh, crash uh, no. So that no. So the way play. that works is when we. Uh, who are in the MetaMask and consensus GitHub organizations try to access any MetaMask or consensus repositories, we get the SSO prompt uh, once a day. Uh, but when everyone else does, uh, they just, you know, if the repo is public, they can just go there as normal. Without mm -hmm. I want some way to get around that. We experienced this at Agoric as well, since we embraced SAML. Uh, you can open it in a private tab <laughs> when you're not logged into GitHub. Uh, that's one way around it. Yeah, and then and then I you want don't to be able to use it on my computer instead of having to use it on this other computer. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So. Uh, <clears throat> yes. To so yeah to return to the orthogonal. So uh, we are almost at, at time, and I can't go. Uh, over for very long. However, to, to sort of recap where we're at in SNAPS today, uh, as opposed to with like our persistence model, we're effectively in like, we're more toward the manual end, pretty far toward the end of the manual side uh, of the spectrum, because you have a an RPC method that you can call in order to like, here, store this blob. And then you can say, give me the blob back. Uh, and then you have to, you know, update the blob every time you have uh, more stuff that you want to store. And I think... And in the pet daemon, we have exactly store blob and store value, <laughs> which is the same. I think that I think that one of the th neat things about embracing the agoric endo stack is that we have a coherent narrative for what is persistible in value space. Uh, both pres what, what, what kinds of uh, a richer... A, a richer than JSON story for persisting and transmitting values and live references and promises that is um, that is consistent. That the, we have the same model for what is storable and persistable. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, the the the, the <laughs> this is sort of cap TP in in whatever embodiment um, versus a JSON RPC. Um, uh, JSON RPC doesn't really have any way to represent object references, for example, um, which turns out to be a, an enormous handicap. Yeah. So to, to the extent that we can improve on the existing um, uh, uh, SNAP's persistence model in a um, uh, easy to use, delightful way uh, without incurring too many um, uh, like complications that we have to deal with, then uh, we should uh, we we will explore that space and see uh, what we can accomplish. Yeah, yeah. sounds yeah. good. So moving, so which is to say, maybe you know, uh, storing different, not just like strictly JSON serialized all that uh, data that you have to you know update and maintain yourself. Uh, you know, maybe some of the like you know blob storage uh, APIs from from Endo, and then sort of. And then perhaps moving more in the direction of automatic to have some, if we could have some sort of notion like, uh, I want, you know, this class to be like the state of this class to be persisted. And yeah, I want it yeah. to be rehydrated when I instantiate it or something like that. Yeah. There, therein lies Mark's big vision of taking a, num a, num a small number, as, as Mark described out of band, there are a small number of packages in the Agoric SDK that he would like to see graduate to endo when they are stable. Well, he wants to see them graduate to endo. I want them to graduate when they're stable. And uh <laughs> cards on the table. <laughs> yeah. And the uh um that would enable you to create something called a zone where certain exos would be bound to a zone and the exo the exo class essentially um would would give you that kind of persistence model that you would periodically be able that these things would be behind the scenes leveraging the existing store value or store store blob api they would be persisting state for objects of particular class and those would be rehydrated from the pet stored state uh after a crash 
crasher upgrade, as it were. Yeah. And I yeah. Think uh, and, and, upgrade and, and, is and, accounted for because because the pet because the pet store behind a caplet can be shared by the next generation of the caplet. Right. Well, there's also there's also I think there's a there's a a kind of a choice in design space there as to whether it's sort of what is the granularity of choice to persist a particular object or not. And one one possibility is, well, if it's a member of the following class, which is defined to be that way, then any instance of that class is is just automatically persisted. An, another is to have some kind of you know, registration mechanism you say please persist this thing and i guess another is uh well it's persisted if it's part of an object graph that descends from some root that you root or set of roots which you have explicitly declared um and i i my my uh, personal inclinations lean towards that latter approach but i'm not sure i understand the the trade-off space well enough to have a lot of faith in that intuition. Well, in any case, we're coming up against the end of our time. Yep. And I think that this has been a great conversation and it will be great for the record for posterity. Um, Hello, posterity. Yeah. I don't know if you're a fan of Flanders and Swan or not. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Oh, thanks everyone. Okay. So.